Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Today, I'll be talking about how you would design a marketplace of data, specifically how you would buy and sell training data for machine learning tasks. This is joint work in advisor Munzer Dale and another student's group, Tuhin Sarkar. So before we start into the formalisms, it's important to ask, why should we design a data marketplace now versus, say, 10 years from now? I think the big reason is that the success of machine learning has made data a currency. There's this great quote by the European Consumer Commissioner, who was a big part of introducing GDPR in Europe. And she said, personal data is the new oil of the internet, the new currency of the digital world. And so if data has become a currency, it's start, time to start thinking about rigorously designing or theorizing about it as a financial asset. And you know, if you go to Silicon Valley, every company says they have a valuation of a billion dollars right now because of the data they're collecting. But it's not obvious what the value of that data is. And so we need a theory for it ASAP. And even right now, there are huge inefficiencies in the way uh, data is being currently bought and sold. So you have companies like Bloomberg and Reuters and Nielsen and they're billion dollar companies, but all they really sell is daily, monthly, weekly uh, refreshes of the same data set, and the people buying it, it's not obvious from their point of view whether they're actually getting predictive accuracy from it. They tend to buy it because they've always bought it and because everyone else has always bought it. And so I think that's another reason why as we move to more real time uh, decision making, we need to find data mechanisms that are more robust and more uh, based on the predictive accuracy you actually get. And um, maybe more seriously, if you look at the last two or three years, there's been huge data breaches, like the Equifax data breach, or the Cambridge Analytica data breach, and you know, 150 million people data was breached, and everyone is up in an uproar, but no real litigation has happened, and the reason is that we can't really value data rigorously. And if you compare this with, say, the 2008 housing crisis, you know, the government could say a trillion dollars worth of damage was caused, and company A is gonna pay this much fine, company B is gonna pay this much fine. And the reason they could do that was because there was a thriving housing market where financial instruments related with housing were constantly bought and sold. And so to do something similar with data, we need to have thriving data marketplaces. And so that's why I believe now is the time to design it. So the next question you can ask is, what really makes data different as a financial asset compared to everything else? Why is it different from an apple? And we've been thinking about this for like two years now. I think we've condensed it down to five main points. The first one is that it's a digital good, so I can keep selling it again and again. Two, which actually makes it the most mathematically interesting, is that it's inherently a combinatorial good. So that means to say you're a, a Starbucks in the Phoenix Convention Center and you have a data set number of coffee cups sold, and your coffee bean right down the street also selling the number of coffee cups sold, the information is, has high overlap, they're highly correlated. So what does it mean to buy one without buying the other? Or what does it mean to buy two of them when you can just have bought one? So these combinatorial effects make it quite challenging to think about um, and different from other kinds of goods. Three is that prediction tasks and the value for accuracy vary widely. So if my hedge fund trying to predict the financial asset versus I'm a precision agriculture company trying to predict uh, the weather so I can do fine crop yields, the types of data that are gonna be valuable for me, the types of prediction tasks I have, and how much I value accuracy are gonna be highly different. Both is when you buy data, you're really buying a string of numbers. And so when you buy a string of numbers, what does it mean to know how much it's worth to you before you apply it to some sort of task? This is very different from saying buying an apple where pretty much everyone in this room's value for an apple is gonna be between $0 and $2. And so we cannot verify this. It's, it is, it's not unreasonable to have a prior for the value of data and um, say, I wanna sell it to you because it's $2. And fifth is that if I'm a hedge fund, I may only find value in a data set if no one else gets access to the data set. So the externalities make it a challenging thing to think about. For this work, we're gonna focus on the first four points. And uh, though the fifth is very interesting, we'll leave that as future work. So what is our main contribution? Our main contribution is what we believe to be an operationalizable architecture to efficiently buy and sell trading data for machine learning tasks. And there are gonna be three big players in this market. First are buyers who come in with some sort of prediction task and how much the value accuracy. They're gonna have sellers who are selling data sets so they can make money from it. And you have a marketplace which is tasked with pricing all the data that's being sold, uh, deciding what data to allocate to buyers, how much revenue to generate, and then based on some amount of money that's been collected, how do you compensate the different sellers for that? Right? And so that's what we're gonna tackle. But before we get into the formalism, I thought it would be easier to digest if we start with a real world example of how we actually got this problem from supply chain uh, optimization. So if any of you are in operations management group, there's this very famous uh, concept in supply chain management called the bullwhip effect. So what that means is that if there's any small uncertainty in customer demand, as you go upstream in the supply chain, by the time you hit the supplier level, that uncertainty grows to become very, very large. That can be extremely costly for the supplier. So it's very important for them to be able to predict customer demand well, because if they don't, it can be very costly for the operations, right? And so they're incentivized to have good predictions. 
So in this market, the buyers would be something like the logistics and the manufacturing companies. So if they want to participate, what's the first thing they need to decide is, well, they need to decide how much they value accuracy. And the good thing is such companies have defined, well-defined cost models for not predicting demand well. For example, they can say a 10% over under capacity costs me $10,000 per week. And so you can potentially make a bid of the following form that I'm willing to pay $1,000 for every percent decrease in oversupply from the previous week. And so that's what a bid would look like. And then the next question is, what else do they need to decide other than how much the value accuracy? Well, the, the machine learning algorithm to decide this is how they're going to want the training data to make predictions. And kind of the dirty little secret no one tells you is that the machine learning algorithms are increasingly commoditized and open source. Everyone's using the same thing. And so no company is differentiating itself based on the machine learning algorithm it uses. It's mostly the data they have access to. And the second thing you need to decide is the prediction gain function. So what is your method for evaluating accuracy? So if you're doing a regression task, it could be something like RMSE, or 1 minus RMSE, or if it's classification, it could be something like accuracy. Right, so that's it. Once you have that, a buyer can start participating in the proposed market. Now, who are sellers? So sellers in our ha um, mind would be companies like, say, Uber and Lyft, selling real-time routing info in your shopping districts. This information could be super useful for a supply chain company, and it could be a source of a great deal of uh, additional revenue for these kinds of companies. Or it could be social media companies selling sentiment data on relevant products. Uh, so a data seller just needs to decide what data they want to provide in the market that they believe is predictive. And that's it. So now we're going to have a little bit of formalism. I'm going to try to keep it as math light as possible. So first, the participants were the sellers and the buyers. So what they're going to be going to say they're M sellers. Each of them is parameterized by T measurements. And then we're going to have the buyers. We're going to say they're n buyers uh, with a prediction task that's denoted yn. And we're just going to say it's the dimension t for simplicity. It doesn't need to be. And along with the prediction task, they also have mu n, which is their private valuation for how much they value a marginal increase in accuracy. So this is something like the, what I've shown before, which is I'm going to pay $1,000 for a percent decrease in oversupply from the previous week. And bn is kind of the analog of mu n, which is the public bid supply to the marketplace. They don't really have to make it the same as a private valuation. So this is the dynamics of the marketplace that we are going to study, which is when the buyers come one at a time, streaming buyers. The sellers are fixed, and there are no externalities. Obviously, this can be extended in many ways, but this is the place to start. And so what happens is first, a market sets the price PN. The buyer N comes with some prediction task. The buyer decides to make a bid into the market. Based on the price that's currently set and the bid, they get allocated some trading data, some features. And then the buyer pays based on the increase in accuracy that they receive. And lastly, the market, based on, say, $100 worth of revenue was generated, is going to divide this revenue amongst the various sellers. Right? And what's important to note is that the buyer end comes to the market exactly once, and once they come, they leave forever. That's the current setting we're dealing with. This can be extended in many ways. OK, so now that we've given you the architecture and a little bit of formalism, what are the kind of the key questions you need to analyze to see whether this marketplace is going to be robust? Well, the first thing is, from the buyer point of view, we need to decide how to make them bid truthfully, and what data to allocate from them, and how much revenue to collect. From the seller's point of view, it's how if, let's say, $100 worth of revenue is generated, what's a fair way of dividing this up amongst all the different sellers? And lastly is that from the market's point of view, how should they set prices so they can maximize revenue from these data sets over time? OK, so we're going to start each of them. We're going to decompose each of them and go into each of them for the rest of the talk. So we're going to start with the buyer's point of view, which is how do they get bids, firms to bid truthfully. So the definition of truthful is extremely standard. It's this complicated mathematical expression that we're going to parse slowly. So the first term is what the utility the buyer gets from estimates provided by the market. G is the prediction gain function, like your RMSC or 1 minus RMSC. And so y hat n is the estimates provided by the machine learning algorithm based on the features that were allocated. The features that were allocated are a function of the bid and then the current price, right, the original features. Good. The second is the payment function, which is the payment made by the buyer to the market. And so we always say is that this market is, is going to be truthful if it uses incentivized to bid truthfully if that maximizes the net utility, the utility minus their payment. That's it. And an important point to make is that the uh, machine learning algorithm is computed by the market. That's not private to the buyer. And I think that's totally fine because it's basically at this point, that's not something that's really proprietary or valuable. So we just consider it a black box machine learning algorithm that we're going to abstract away for the rest of the talk. Right? So what is the market designed to make things truthful? It designs the payment function and the allocation function. So let's deep dive into how one would go about designing that. So before I get into that, it's about to, key modeling choice we make, and it looks kind of innocuous, I think is extremely important, is how we define buyer utility. So the first point is that a buyer gets utility from good quality predictions. They do not care what data sets give them those predictions. If I'm a logistics company, I do not care if it's Starbucks coffee cups that are giving me good predictions or coffee beans. I just want to make good predictions. So 
So that's the first key point that, that needs to be, I hope I can uh, send across. Second is that we say the mu n is the marginal gain in accuracy for the moment is a scalar parameter. So, um, so it's something along the lines of we're going to pay $1,000 for a percent decrease in accuracy, um, decrease in oversupply. Right? So those are the key modeling assumptions we make. After we do this, everything kind of flows naturally. So if you do that, then the very famous Meyerson's payment rule that has existed for the last 30, 40 years gives you what you want. It actually gives you truthfulness. As long as you say that if I bid more, I cannot get a decrease in accuracy. So if I bid, if I'm going to pay $1,000, if I'm going to pay $1,500, I should not get any less accuracy for bidding $1,500. And for visually, for people who haven't seen how this function looks like, it looks something like this. As I go from Bn prime to Bn, where Bn is larger than Bn prime, my gain is going up. And that green area under this curve is where I'm going to collect. If you do that, that ensures truthfulness, as long as you have a monotonic allocation function. Good? OK. So now I haven't talked about what the allocation function is. So the truthfulness in Meyerson's payment function says that all it requires is that the increase in bid implies an increase in accuracy. So this allows for a wide variety of allocation functions. So for example, you could noise the data, as we've heard previously. So you could adjust the quality by degrading the features by some Gaussian noise or Laplace noise, whatever it is. Or you could allocate some subset of features where I maintain a different price for each feature. And then as long as my bid is higher than the feature, I allocate it. There are many different methods. I'm going to focus on the case of noising data. And I'll motivate why later on in the talk. So we did the buyer's point of view. Now let's move on to the seller's point of view, is how you would divide this revenue fairly amongst the various sellers. And this actually was a favorite part of this work for me, so I hope you enjoyed it. So a, um, a standard notion in cooperative coalition games is something called the Shapley value. And it's the unique allocation mechanism uh, that gives you the, these following properties, is that balance, which is that all revenue that is generated is divided amongst the different sellers. Symmetry is that means that there are two different sellers selling the exact same feature, they get the same revenue. And third is zero property. So if I'm just selling, let's say, Gaussian noise into this model, into this market, I get nothing. Right? And so what's the algorithm? It's actually very pretty. It says you take a feature, you take a power set of the m minus one other features, you look at the average gain you get on each of those power sets, you take the average, and that's the Shapley allocation. And this was in designed in the 1950s, I believe. And uh, it was great then, but it runs in exponential times. So that's not very good. It's not feasible for our case, when there may be a million features being sold in such a data marketplace. So what do you do? Well, the good thing is uh, you can do a randomized Shapley allocation. So forget about the math, just look at the words. It basically says you sample a permutation over M. You compute, and this is for computing the Shapley allocation of features small m. So I sample a permutation of a big M. I compute the net gain of feature M over every feature that came before it in the permutation. I do this k times, and I average the net gain. And that's my Shapley, uh, approximate Shapley allocation. Now, why is this a good idea? It's because of the simple observation that we made is that the Shapley allocation can be written as an expectation over all of these permutations. And so if you apply pretty standard concentration equality, you actually get exponential concentration. And hence, you get this nice statement, which is that the Shapley approx gives you an epsilon approximation of the Shapley value as long as k is of the order m over epsilon squared. Now, are is everything great? We have done the Shapley value. No, it's not. And the reason is that data can be replicated freely. So say I have two features A and B, and $1 worth of revenue was generated. Now, let's say both of those features are exactly the same. So then by the symmetry property of Shapley value, they would each get half and half. But Starbucks, knowing this, would replicate the data and sell it again as A prime. Right? Now, again, because of the symmetry property, you're going to get one third, one third, and one third. And so A, which has not added any more information to the market, is now getting two thirds of the value, even though they haven't done anything. So that's not very good. So the standard notion of credit allocation in, in mechanism design game theory is not robust to replication, so it doesn't really work for digital goods. So what are you going to do? Well, uh, again, the features about data make it come to the rescue. So data has a nice notion of pairwise distance. For example, you could compute the cosine similarity, or the total variation distance, or the mutual information if you're selling distributions. And so all you, I'm saying is to do, it's a very simple fix. You run the Shapley approximate, and then you downweight each feature based on how similar it is to every other feature. And if you downweight it just the right amount, uh, in particular if you exponentially downweight it, you can provably show that it's robust to replication. So are we good now? Well, unfortunately, still not. And the reason is we have lost balance. right? So all the revenue is no longer being allocated to all the features. Is it possible to have both balance and uh, replication robustness? Unfortunately, no. You can create very easy count examples to show that it's not possible. So whose revenue is being depressed? Is it everyone's revenue that's being depressed uniformly? No. It's only features that have highly correlated information with other sellers, only their information is penalized. So if I have information that is orthogonal to everyone else's information with respect to the similarity metric the marketplace has chosen, 
then uh, my information will not, my, my revenue will not be penalized at all. So the next question you could ask is that amongst all the different um, credit allocation mechanisms that exist, which is the most balanced preserving of the robust replication mechanisms? And we provide both necessary and sufficient conditions to solve this in the paper. And I guess the, the thing I want to leave you with is that the payment division the algorithm we're deciding is kind of incentivizes the collection of useful, unique data. All right, so we're done with the bias point of view, done with the seller's point of view. I'll finish off in the last few minutes with uh, how you should set prices for these data sets to maximize revenue over time from the market's point of view. So the market must set prices before the, enter, before the buyer enters the market to ensure truthfulness. It's a necessary condition. So how do you set prices before knowing what the bid is? Well, you can apply a very standard uh, a regret minimization framework. That's the way we're choosing to think about this problem. For those of you who don't know it, is essentially you choose a price such that the, the difference with the optimal price is going to be sublinear in N, where N is the number of buyers that are coming one at a time. Right? So you want to come around and learn what this, the optimal thing you could have done in, the, in, in hindsight. And we're going to focus on a standard zero regret algorithm called multiple weights, because you don't want to make prior distributions of what kinds of people are coming into this market. So what are the key challenges of applying something like a multiple of weights in, such, in our framework? Well, you need, let's say you set prices for each different uh, feature. These are combinatorial goods. And because they're combinatorial goods, something like multiple of weights is going to have exponential running time. That's not good. It's not feasible again. And so and another issue is that Myerson celebrated results says if you have a single parameter and a single item, then a single threshold all or nothing pricing is the best thing to do. In our case, it's distinctly not the best thing to do. And the reason is that a buyer has two parameters, yn, which is their prediction class, and mu n, which is their um, valuation for accuracy. So since I have a bit of time, I can actually go through the count examples since it's so simple. Say y1 is your prediction task, and x1 is equal to y1. And this y2 is another prediction task, and x2 is equal to y2. And mu1 is the valuation for y1, um, and mu2 is the valuation for y2. There's just two types of people in this market. Clearly, in this market, you should not be setting the same price. You should be setting $100 for if you see a task of y1, and $50 if you see a task of y2. And so clearly, because of the fact that there are two parameters, it lets myosin be truthful uh, in terms of when you want to do the, the payment function, but it does not give you this all or nothing result that has been a workhorse in, in mechanism design. So, what can we do? And again, the nice thing is that, as we saw in earlier in, the, in the, the earlier talks, is that data is peculiar in the sense that even though these are subset problems, so I'm trying to select subset of the features to give to people, you can also kind of think of it as a continuous good. You can kind of lift it to a continuous good by adding noise to all of the features. So I can kind of degrade all of the information in a very fine way by adding different amounts of noise to it. And so, for example, one thing you could do is that each, for each feature, I add Gaussian noise to it based on the difference between the current price and the bid that's being made. Right. And the informal theorem statement is that if all the bids come from some bounded set, so you know no one's going to bid over a million dollars for a percent increase in accuracy, and higher noise leads to lower quality estimates, which I hope is how statistics works, then the average regret of price update algorithms is going to be decaying, just as you would hope, as the standard in regret. Um, so, to conclude, we believe that um, we believe, that to the best of our knowledge, that the first model to formalize a two-sided data market, especially for in the context of machine learning, we laid out some of the key challenges, and we provided an algorithmic solution by tweaking a standard algorithmic game theory techniques such as Myerson's payment, Shapley value, regret minimization, and there's a whole set of things that you could be doing in the future. For example, what's the optimal allocation function? Is it adding Gaussian noise? Is it adding something else? I don't know. So that's a very interesting thing to think about. And one question that I think is super interesting and fundamental in this problem, I have no way of thinking about it, is how you divide an efficient bidding language to capture the externalities of, of data replication. So right now we're bidding a single number, which is BN. But say I care about who else gets the data. I don't want to send a huge table of things because it's not be intractable. What's an elegant way of thinking about how to bid about your externalities of data replication? And then the similarity metric, right? I talked about you didn't downweight everyone's data by based on how similar it is to everyone else's data. But say now I perform some weird nonlinear transformation of the data and sell it again. Again, I'm not really added anything. Um, that's not probably a good thing. So how do you create these similarity metrics that are robust in nonlinear transformations and they're tractable? And um, that's it, really. Thank you. Yes, and I think that's an implicit 
a benefit of this model is that let's say you sold data, then the data is now out in the wild, so there's no longer any value for the person who is selling data to sell it again because someone else could sell it. So in this case, you're actually only selling the predictions. The data itself is not leaving the marketplace. Yes, you could do that. You could potentially do that, yes. It would be probably an equivalent way of thinking about it. Yes. Go ahead. So yeah, we assume that, let's say you can do it based on some test set that's been agreed upon or based on some future estimates of what actually happens, so and so forth. We're not talking about how you could game the prediction task itself. We're not considering that problem. Right. Yes. Exactly. So I found that to make this tractable, I want to modularize it as much as possible. Maybe now is the time to kind of think of them together. I, I don't know, but that's that's a good idea. I haven't actually thought about that. Thanks very okay. much. Sorry, we're out of time. Right, but thanks again.